Ingram. Brian Ingram. <laughs> yes, I am Brian Ingram. I work at Argonne National Laboratory, the other national lab in the Chicagoland area. And Fermi, you're not the only one that has an accelerator ring. We have the advanced photon source where we use uh, high, high intensity x-rays to study materials. And we have lots of other projects, and I've just shown a few here. I work in the battery department, and that's what I'll be talking about this evening. Um, but before I begin talking at the physics slam at Fermi National Lab, I have a confession to make. I am a chemist. <laughs> Actually, I'm a material scientist engineer. So, what does that mean? In the broad spectrum of science and technology, there's fundamental probing the unknown over here, and there is optimization and development of a widget to sell over here. And my work is somewhere, I don't know, about maybe about here. So I look at the fundamental science and try to lead it towards the development of new technologies. Um, so, I have a question for everybody out there, and I'm going to make an assumption that almost all of you, if not all of you, have a cell phone. How many of you know what the lifetime left on your battery is right now? Show of hands. Right? Oh, that's pretty good. But basically everybody. I, I know I have 72%. I put my phone down there and I checked it before I came out. So, we really want to believe that we live in a wireless world, but at the same time, we're tethered to our power cords, right? Um, and here I'm showing the old energy system, uh, the old energy grid. And it served us very well for half a century. But this is what the new one looks like. More renewables, more power consumption, more electric vehicles on the road. And we're going to need advanced batteries to make that happen. I mean, it's happening, but we need to really need the advanced batteries to make it, to keep going forward. So energy, we need it, we want it, we consume it. It comes in lots of forms, we know that. But tonight we're gonna to focus on chemical and electrical energy combined into what we know as batteries. So, what is a battery? Here's a nice picture of a lithium ion battery, which since you all have cell phones, we've already covered that. You all have one of these in your pocket or your purse or your wherever. Um, there's chemical reactions that occur. And when you allow these chemical reactions to occur, electrons flow in an external circuit and power a device. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the, chem the chemistry there in a second. But first, when you design a battery system, there's two things you care about. The voltage, which is a function of the materials, the chemistry that's in your, in your battery, and the charge capacity, or the amount of electrons you can uh, put in the battery. And that is the, by the amount of material or the size of the battery. A bigger battery has more electrons. So here are the details. They don't really matter. I mean, of course they matter, but they don't matter for tonight. We just care about the numbers, okay? If I know the voltage and I know the charge capacity, I can determine what the energy density, how much energy is in a lithium ion battery. And for this standard chemistry I'm showing, it's about 600 watt hours per kilogram. Now, what is that? Well, I'll just compare it to maybe some other batteries that you might be more familiar with. A lead acid in your, in your car or uh, nickel metal hydrides in your home. So you can see that just by changing the chemistries and going to lithium ion, we have a lot more energy in, in our batteries. And that's great. Um, so, okay, how does lithium ion battery work? So, there's two materials on either side of the battery. There's a graphite which has lithium in, in, in the layers. Lithium is these purple spheres. And, you have, and, and over on the other side of the battery, you have a cobalt oxide phase, layered phase, that has a, a little bit of lithium. And what I'm showing here is the, the voltage of the cell as lithium literally moves from one side to the other. So let's watch what happens. All right, so all the lithium went from the graphite over to the, uh, the cobalt oxide. Now, right now the battery has no energy left in it. We've discharged it, we've used it, we've run our cell phones. We have to put energy back into it. So we plug it into the wall, and the exact opposite happens. That lithium moves back over to the graphite, 
and you, put, and you have a voltage on your cell and you have stored energy again. And that's how lithium ion battery works. Now, that was an incredible piece of science that went into that. It was 30, 40 years worth of research that went into that to understand how lithium can be shuttled between two materials, between two atomic structures, without destroying the structure. In fact, it's such an amazing feat of science and material science and chemistry and physics that it's almost like if you go to a bowling alley and you're sitting down, you're tying on your rented shoes, and the guy who owns this place comes over and says, all right, the rules are different tonight. Instead of knocking down the pins, you got to roll the ball down, have it sit between the pins without knocking a single pin over. And it's, it is that incredible. It's an amazing thing. So, so the science went into developing, but science also can be used, this fundamental science can also be used to help overcome some of the inherent challenges that we face in lithium ions. So for instance, how many of you swear that your battery in your phone doesn't work as long as it used to when you first bought it, right? I mean, I know I feel that. You're absolutely right. It doesn't. Uh, and, and here, this just shows you. So this battery was charged and discharged 800 times. So we used it, we charged it, we used it, we charged it 800 times. 60, 70 percent less energy was stored in it after that time period. But we know why. When the lithium shuttles into the, the cobalt, uh, cobalt oxide phase, it doesn't always go back to the same place. And that, those layers shift. They evolve a little bit with time each time. And so you lose a little bit of the material. It, the voltage drops a little bit, or the capacity, the amount of lithium that it, it can accept decreases. What about wanting to charge your battery fast, right? I mean, a car, right? You fill it up with gasoline. It takes about two minutes to fill a car up. Maybe if you have a big truck, it may take four or five minutes, right? Well, you want to do the same. Well, that's a challenge. And we know why it, that, that's the case as well. Think about it. When you're running, if you're running late to a plane, right, and you're running through the airport, and you're running as fast as you can, you get to the plane, you run down the little thing, and you get to the plane, and you basically stop at the doorway because everybody's trying to put their luggage up, try to find their seats. The same thing happens to lithium. It can get to the material fast, but once it gets there, it kind of gets bottleneck at the doorways, at the surfaces. And so you can see here, all that lithium kind of gets in there and stops, and it doesn't let any more lithium come in. So you actually lose a little bit of capacity when you charge fast. And this is a favorite. I always like to talk about this one. Everybody wonder why when you go to work, you've charged, you go to school, and you've charged your battery overnight. And you, know, you, you get on there, and you, you do a few things, check your email, and it's 100%. It's 95%, maybe mid-morning. Maybe right before lunch, it's like 90%. And then like 20 seconds later, it's 20%. You're just like, what? Well, your device is really looking at the voltage of your battery, and it's sort of sitting in that flat part there. And it's kind of guessing, because it doesn't really know where it is on that. And all of a sudden, the voltage starts going down that cliff. And all of a sudden, your device is like, panic. I got to tell my owner. I got to tell my owner we're about to run out of the battery. So that's what's happening. So there's a lot of science that's gone into lithium ion. And lithium ion is an incredible technology. But at Argonne, we are really interested in looking at the next generation of batteries as well. And so the Joint Center of Energy Storage Researchers, we like to call it Jay Caesar, is looking at probing new materials. And so lithium ion kind of lives up in this area. And so this is voltage and, and capacity. And remember that, that that product is indeed the energy of a battery. So what happens if we can operate up in that region, right? If we can find materials. So this is a calculation done by my colleagues. Um, and we looked, we're looking at these materials, and indeed, we are making and trying and investigating the science behind the materials up in the top right of that plot and trying to make the batteries that will be the batteries that, that maybe we'll be using in a few years or certainly our children will be using. So what will a world of a new battery look like? Well, I think we can use our cell phones as a good example. Cell phones exist as we know them today because the batteries got good enough to power them, right? They can, we, can, we can have a, lot, a big screen, we can do things with our phones, we can be on our email all day long because lithium ion was, was, was developed. Cars, electric vehicles are on the road today, but what do we need to get them to be cheaper and let more lightweight? I mean, the Tesla is a beautiful car, right? But we need to, it would be great if the price came down and we could all afford one. And then, of course, there's, there's grid storage. Uh, so the renewables, hydro, wind, 
solar. It needs energy storage. So we are looking at replacing lithium ion with something that's even better. So what does the world look like with new batteries? Imagination can be anything it wants, but it's going to be pretty cool because we're going to be pretty mobile and not tethered to our power cords anymore. Thank you.